this uh, this webinar is brought to you by the uh, Emerging Technologies Committee, and uh, it highlights and provides updates on full impl full scale implementations of two representative struvite recovery technologies in the Pacific Northwest. The Astera Nutrient Recovery Technology, which has been implemented at the Clean Water Services Wastewater Treatment Facilities in Oregon. And uh, Peter Schauer from Clean Water Services is going to uh, present on that. And the Multiform P Recovery System implemented at the West uh, Boise Wastewater Treatment Facility at the City of Boise. And Bill Binko and Ron Gearhart are going to speak uh, to that. Uh, a couple things about uh, uh, the presentations. We will have uh, PDFs available afterwards. Uh, we, will we are also going to ask you a couple of poll questions during the presentation. And when we ask those poll questions, uh, it's kind of a nice break to make sure everybody's, uh, you know, um, not nodding off there. Sometimes computers are kind of hard to keep paying attention on. But we also needed to respond to those so we can verify we actually have X number of attendees for CEU purposes. So those poll questions are important. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, hand this over to Peter Schauer, who's going to start off. And uh, Peter, I'm giving you control here. And Peter will introduce himself. Um, you notice that great picture of him there. Peter doesn't have a sense of humor or anything. Uh, Hi, thank you, Michael. And I am there we go. attempting to share the screen right now. Uh, Michael, can you tell me if you can see it? Yep, we're good. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for um, thank you for setting this up. It's actually pretty exciting. I, I think when we're talking about phosphorus recovery, um, that I run into the same guys everywhere we go, and we're all from the Pacific Northwest. So I think it's something that we as a uh, of a, of a section uh, should be very proud of is that we're, we're really blazing the way in terms of phosphorus recovery and to always be running I mean I heard Keith is on the line and the folks from Boise uh, no matter where the conferences are it's it's great to see that we're, we're at the forefront of it so to give you a little bit of background on me uh, my name is Peter Shower I'm with Clean Water Services we're a utility uh, outside of uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, previous to uh, um, Clean Water Services, I worked with Black and Beach, and prior to that with, uh, with the Navy as a civilian making uh, shipboard membrane bioreactors work, and was a graduate at Johns Hopkins. So I am across from the, the, the states from the East Coast, and uh, I love it out here, so please don't make me go back. At least I'm not from California. Um, I believe that we were going to start off with a simple poll question to to kick things off. I know you're looking at my screen, but um, Michael, do we have a, a poll question to, to we, kick we things do. off? We do. Hang on just a moment here. Uh, pretty simple. Here we go. Uh, it's a yes or no answer. Okay, the answers are coming in. We'll give it a few more seconds here. Okay, I have not sure I got the answer, but we'll show it to everybody. There. So hopefully I haven't put anyone to sleep yet before we get into the meat of the presentation. There, there's your answers, Peter, on that first poll question. 65% yes, 35% no on uh, are you considering or have you considered, uh, et cetera, uh, implementing Struvite recovery technologies. So. Great. Well, then you must be in the right uh, webinar right now. So uh, I can't tell if are we back to my slides. Yes, we are. Excellent. So what I'll be talking about is uh, what we've learned here since uh, about 2009 when we started down this path, or well, the full scale down the path of uh, uh, nutrient recovery. 
and uh, some of the lessons learned that we've uh, we've really been understanding over these times, why we did it in the first place, um, and what we still have out there that we want to learn more about. And it's one of the exciting things about our industry is that, boy, it's never over. It's not like uh, Activated Sludge celebrated 100 years of Activated Sludge just a little bit ago, and boy, we're still learning about it uh, as we go here about how to how to do better. So I hope in 100 years we're looking back on Struvite recovery and uh, still pushing the envelope. So a little more about Clean Water Services. Um, we are just outside of Portland, Oregon, serving, uh, serving Washington County, which is here in yellow that you can see. But the important thing to me is what's on the relief map that's under that. And that is the Tualatin River Shed. And it's a very slow-moving river. It's pretty much a long, skinny lake during the summer when we have low flows and it's effluent dominated from drink plants that we have very low phosphorus limits that we have to hit in there. So everything that we do has to pile back into the idea of what can we do to serve the people in blue here while protecting the rest of the river shed. And to do that, we have four treatment plants, two that are larger regional facilities, a number of different pump stations, and of course all the all the veins and arteries getting all the wastewater to us in the collection system. So one of our major uh, regional treatment plants is the Durham facility, uh, shown here. And uh, it's a little, little spread out. We have a little more elbow room at this facility. Uh, the the Stubite Recovery Facility is at pretty much the bottom of the graph here. And if you can see my mouth, it's right at the bottom of this area where it was an old uh, pump station that we had had. Um, over at Rock Creek, I failed to mention that's a 20 MGD, it's a figure about 200,000 population equivalent uh, that, that, that that uh, facility serves. The Rock Creek facility, on the other hand, serves about 300,000 uh, folks. Um, similar process technologies are all involved, uh, preliminary, primary, uh, uh, biological nutrient removal in the sec secondary system, a tertiary process to really polish for phosphorus. Um, and on the liquids, pro uh, the solids process side, uh, we are doing um, fermentation of our primary sludge at both facilities and thickening our WAS at both facilities and doing something called WAS strip that we'll uh, speak about later and then going through anaerobic digestion. <coughs> and this site's a little more constrained, but we were able to put the uh, Strubite Recovery Facility right here towards the bottom. If you can see the, the mouse, there's a little white building uh, lower-ish left area here. So right in the thick of everything, which is a nice thing. So let's talk about how we approach, uh, you know, approach treatment. For the most part, our biggest item to worry about is phosphorus removal. So if we just look at it in a linear, simplistic way, you're coming through the primary clarifier, you go through the secondary process, through the tertiary, and you can just use chemicals. You can put chemicals in ahead of the primary clarifier. You can put chemicals in right ahead of the tertiary clarifier to hit these low limits. And when we have to hit about 0.1 milli, when we have to hit exactly 0.1 milligrams per liter of a total phosphorus, it means our orthophosphorus must be pretty much zero, non-detected. 0.01 is really the trigger point, which we'll have problems with uh, other species of phosphorus coming out if we're not that low on orthophosphorus. Uh, so you can pretty much just add chemicals to meet all of these things, but then you're creating these orange boxes here. This chemical sludge that goes to your digester, takes up room, and takes up space in your, your final, uh, uh, final treatment, uh, on your final sludge that you're trying to haul off uh, and land apply. So instead, a lot of us do this. We look towards uh, biological phosphorus removal. And just a simplistic view of how that biological phosphorus removal works, it's pretty much telling your bugs, hey, you guys do the work. We're not giving you a bunch of chemicals. And so in the anaerobic zone, they release a little bit of phosphorus, breaking some change so that the chains of uh, polyphosphates so that they can take up this really tasty volatile fatty acids. And when they hit the aerobic zones, they go, great, we'll use those volatile fatty acids stored in our cells and grow and get better, and we'll take up a bunch of phosphorus and recreate all those little bonds within ourselves. 
So the phosphorus cycle, I think we're all pretty aware. Yes, it's cycling up and down uh, in the anaerobic and, and uh, aerobic situation. So you can get your bugs to do this work for you without adding a bunch of uh, elements to the system. But no good deed goes unpunished. Um, I These are just three pictures that I have, uh, although I would love to collect more from other folks. And I think the guys from Boise have some similarly uh, scary uh, pictures that they have a struvite forming in their pipes. So one of the odd things that happens after doing biological phosphorus removal is you end up creating nice situation for struvite to form. And struvite, if I go to the next page, is when you have your ammonia, your phosphate, and you have some magnesium. And we'll get a little more into that magnesium later. Take a couple waters of hydration, and you turn it into this really nasty struvite, this ammonium phosphate magnesium hexahydrate that just plates out on everything as a pain in the butt. So 10 years ago, everyone heard struvite. They would shudder, get nervous, say this is the worst stuff a treatment plant can ever, can ever do or deal with. Um, <clears throat> it is usually magnesium that, this, that is a limiting nutrient. So you got to do a little something. Um, to, to manage, uh, to, to actually create the struvite where you want it to in the system. So you, you've gone to biological phosphorus removal. What are you going to do now, uh, now that you've created these struvite conditions, and what can you do to make things even better? Um, well, when you start taking away all the chemical sludge, and you're not adding as much element to the primary clarifier or the tertiary, you end up with a, a large amount of phosphorus and ammonia coming back from the anaerobic digestion process. And that's not surprising. That's the same thing that happens in the bugs. When they got hit anaerobic conditions, they'll release that phosphorus, uh, break those polyphosphate bonds. And when they get digested, they release everything within them. Uh, so that can add up to quite a bit of phosphorus load coming into the treatment plant and just make the whole job that much more difficult. You're spinning around all of this phosphorus and it can lead to process instability. So what, what do we do about that? So let's think about removing the phosphorus from the recycle. Yeah, just by the idea of, of uh, removing it, you should be able to increase your, your uh, enhanced biological phosphorus removal stability. You should be able to reduce the amount of alum maybe that you use, and then there's the, the the downstream effects of using less alum. You don't need as much lime and you aren't creating as much biosolids. But you could do that you know, a number of different ways and just get rid of the phosphorus. Or you could add a little bit of alum and target it in a couple of areas. But let's look at a way of doing it and creating something good out of it. Instead of having to deal with biosolids, which are, and I, I always have to remind myself, the biosolids are a form of reuse. We are, we are using our biosolids, not disposing of them. But struvite is a much higher value product that can come out of it. Um, so we'll help ourselves in the system, and we'll be able to create a source of revenue coming into the process. And I would encourage everyone, um, if you're not very familiar with you know, what had happened back turn of the century with uh, nitrogen and scarcity of nitrogen before the Haber-Bosch process. But phosphorus is, is similarly limited in the environment. So not only are we trying to keep it out of the environment because we don't want algal blooms and we have all these limits, but it's a great resource that we need to think about. Um, so it's these types of factors that all go into a treatment facility being able to say, this is the right answer for us. Um, so as we start thinking about ways to recover the phosphorus, and maybe we're just making a small dent right now, but it is this type of incremental improvement that I think that can help us through in the future as we still need phosphorus for all living things um, to grow. So we go with struvite in this form of crystal green as part of uh, Ostara. And the crystal green is, the, with the struvite is a 5280 10% magnesium fertilizer. It meant nothing to me before we started doing this process. But it's the ammonia, uh, phosphorus, uh, potassium um, content within the fertilizer. It's slow release. The same way that this struvite is a pain in the butt in your pipes, it releases really nice and slow in the environment in a, under acidic conditions. So it can also be very good. Um, and as, as it's being made here, you can see these 
different bottles of the different size sizes that are made, you know, 100 SGN number up to 350 or in some oversized product. It is not a biosolid. It is a pure crystal uh, that's being created here. So it doesn't have to be treated as a biosolid, bio as a crystal green. So we went into this and did a pilot test uh, probably, I want to say 2006, or uh, maybe it was 2007, uh, when we did a pilot test of, of doing Shuvite recovery. At that time, realized this is really great. We, we could go forward with this full scale, and we could use an old building. So we installed a Shuvite recovery facility, F SRF, at the Durham treatment plant. And essentially, the way the technology works is it's an upflow continuous uh, recycling reactor. So you're expanding this bed of prill within it and self-regulating uh, what sizes end up where just based on the upflow velocity. The diameter changes, the upflow velocity goes down. So you're able to get that large product down at the bottom and you keep it fluidized by continuously recycling what's going on in, in the system. And in 2009, this was put in. We put in a few reactors. They worked great. To a point where in 2011, we put in the next generation of, of uh, the STAR reactors, which is the Pearl 2000 reactor. And this we actually built a new building for. And that is a wonderful thing. One thing that I would add up to, or end up telling folks is, yeah, the first installation, there was a lot to be learned and a lot to be you know, taken on faith uh, that this technology would work. Boy, not retrofitting a system into a small cramped uh, facility was much nicer for Rock Creek. We were able to use a base slab of what was the previous building and put in these new reactors here. It works a lot better. It's a different design for the reactors, much higher capacity. And then we also got smarter. Instead of being a Struvite recovery facility, let's call it what it is. It's a nutrient recovery facility. And it's interesting talking to, to operators at both plants uh, where uh, if you say NERF or SRF, you know, which one are we talking about? But it is a matter of identifying that we're recovering the nutrients. It's not just struvite, it's nutrients that's the focus here. So what happened at Durham since we did all of this? In 2000, 2008, 7 and 8, high alum dosages. And right after we put in the unit, we were able to realize some pretty nice uh, reductions in the amount of alum that we used within the system. Around 2011, 2012, we went to a different process that ended up with some instability, but we've since recovered and gotten down to some pretty nice alum dosages coming through. <clears throat> but one thing that we did find is struvite, this nuisance struvite, is still a concern. We're lucky we do not have the struvite form as much in the pipes as it does just as sand within the digesters itself. So it's taking up room in the digester. It creates these nice little sand banks. It ends up integrating into the solids cake that we send out. And we have this sparkly, you know, we have fairy dust in our poop. Um, so we have this really nice uh, sparkly, sparkly biosolids <clears throat> that we can recover more phosphorus from after the digester. But pretty much all the magnesium that goes into the digester creates some type of struvite in there. And trying to suppress that formation is incredibly difficult. So the idea was, how do we deal with this? Well, let's talk for a second why magnesium comes up and why the struvite was ever a problem when we talk about uh, phosphorus removal biologically. And it's because not only is the phosphorus going into and out of these bugs, magnesium is used as a counter ion. A uh, positive counter ion that comes into the bugs, comes in, and then is released. So it, you're in, ending up concentrating quite a bit of magnesium within these uh, phosphate accumulating organisms that releases in the digester. So gosh, every bit of that magnesium we send in there is going to hurt us. Thankfully, it doesn't release as much magnesium as there is phosphorus. It's a, a ratio, could be down uh, around 0.3 molar ratio. Um, that a lot of that phosphorus gets tied back up as, as uh, struvite, but there still is more phosphorus that comes out the, at, at the end of the dewatering process. So this is essentially what happens. If you think about the cartoony little uh, magnesium and phosphorus coming in, it's all soluble, it releases in the anaerobic zone, it's taken up in the aerobic zone, and goes to solids processing with all the phosphorus and magnesium in it. That's where it releases. 
well, heck, let's just not send that phosphorus and magnesium to the digester. So the idea was, well, let's, let's release it in some type of process and send that phosphorus and magnesium with very little ammonia directly to the struvite recovery process and keep it out of the digester. And this little seesaw here is the idea of every pretty much pound or 100 kilograms, because I was trying to be good for WEFTEC to stay with uh, SI units, 100 kilograms of magnesium going into that digester is going to be a ton of struvite that's produced inside the digester. And that we're not getting any money from, and we're having to pay to haul it off and land apply. We're going to have to deal with uh, it forming in really weird areas. So let's, let's see what we can do to keep the magnesium out of the process. So what we found when we instigated the, uh, the Y-strip process is that we ended up increasing our amount of phosphorus loading to the struvite recovery process considerably. Um, this blue dots are what was coming from dewatering centrate, and the red dots are what's coming from the Y-strip process. And you can see that not only is it just as much phosphorus as coming from the digester, it's more. And most of our loading coming into the, to the recovery process is coming from that uh, WAS strip uh, stream. And it's helped us to boost our amount of uh, phosphorus to recovery um, by implementing this process. And along with the uh, increased amount of uh, struvite uh, or phosphorus loaded onto the system, we have an increased amount of, of struvite that's harvested. Um, so as part of that, we initially tried this out in 2011 and said, hey, this, this does work, but we don't have the capacity at Rock Creek, at Durham, for uh, that increased loading. Um, so we had to go back in and retrofit one of those Pearl 500 units with the Pearl 2000 unit. Um, while we, ha we were doing that retrofit, we actually were offline and ha thus had a reduction in the amount of struvite we, we recovered. Uh, and then brought it back online, learned a number of things, and have increased our amount of struvite production over this time as well. But then came along Wash Strip 2.0. You can make the phosphorus release in a, in a release tank if uh, you add VFAs to it. But then we thought, you know, that those are VFAs we really want to use in the main treatment liquids process uh, to get better bio-P. How about we pre-thicken it? and send it into the release tank and let it endogenously release. Um, it's a fermenter at this point. Um, and, and what we found is we could use some existing facilities. We have a, a gravity thickener here just ahead of our storage tank. And that made it so that instead of a short retention time to release the phosphorus, it's a lot thicker now. And we could just leave it in the same size tank and do this endogenously, hold it for about a day's worth. And then through the thickening, we use the centrifuge at Durham, that flow ends up going down to a, a star. Oh, sorry, that thickening overflow here. It's kind of an odd figure the way I put it. So the thickening overflow goes to a star, and the thickened uh, WAS ends up going to the digesters. Uh, so what happens in the system? We're usually running about a day. So the first thing I was a little concerned with uh, this is, I, I apologize, this is actually ammonia. The title is correct, the axis is wrong. The ammonia concentration coming out, you are creating some ammonia because you're doing a little bit of digestion in your fermentation process here, but it's not excessively high. You, know, you get much over a day, you're, you're creating more and more ammonia. So we wanted to stay away from conditions where we're creating a lot of ammonia, which also you know, you're now giving back one of those building blocks to create struvite in your pipes. Um, and pick the right area. And one thing that we could look at is the VFA concentration. We all know fermenters are going to produce VFAs. But because we're doing this with the, the WAS stream, um, all those PAOs take up the VFAs immediately. And they're like, great, this is wonderful. We're going to use them and release our phosphorus. So at lower detention times, we saw no excess VFA, and that meant that the bugs were able to uh, uptake all of the VFAs that were created in the system and weren't accumulating some additional VFAs. Once we hit around this one day mark, and it's wild to me that we're talking about one day, because it just seems like I've gotten lazy with my uh, significant figures, but it is pretty much 
at this one day mark, we've satisfied all these PAOs, and now at this point we're just digesting, and that's when we're getting more phosphorus, uh, any little bit more of phosphorus coming out of the system. So it's kind of a wild uh, idea that you actually watch for the VFAs for where the optimal point is to operate. So the positive impacts of this. Hey, looking at what's coming out of the digester and uh, how much magnesium I'm keeping out of the digester is somewhere between 200 and 800 kilograms per day that I've avoided. So that's not accumulating in our pipes as much as it is going out with our product at the end of the, the day. Um, we're being able to uh, produce more struvite by a matter of going to the wash strip. But the questions are, well, yeah, shouldn't our phosphorus in the sludge go down? And I've never been able to show this, and I've refused to show wild graphs that, you know, if I have no phosphorus coming out in the effluent, and I'm recovering phosphorus <coughs> as part of the, the Ostara system, it's got to not be coming, it's got to uh, be reduced in our sludge cake. Our significant figures on those values, I don't really see a big reduction. So from a land application, if you're phosphorus uh, limited on your land application, at least our numbers won't allow us to really exploit or use that to the best of our ability. Um, but in essence, it should be true. The other idea is, does this improve the dewaterability? That's a little bit of a wild one that kind of came to us later on. Uh, here's a little uh, example. This was, we only did this a couple of times because there, there's very little, I think, that, uh, quantification that can be done in this. But looking at our centrate, uh, our digested sludge, we did see less struvite um, uh, in that digested sludge after we implemented wash strip. Um, but I don't feel good about giving a quantitative uh, number to that reduction. Uh, but in terms of dewaterability, one thing that we should talk about is this theory that dewaterability is impacted by the amounts of divalent and, and monovalent uh, cation uh, for bridging. That if you have a divalent, two positives, it helps create more of these flocks that come together. If you think of the biological flock as negatively charged and positive cations, they're going to create bridges if, it can, if it's got two pluses. If there's a lot of one pluses, in the system, they kind of attach to these negative points and, and don't allow the sludge to, to really dewater as much. So what difference does that even make in, in our system? Um, well, one is BPR has been uh, implicated as one of the problems of why you have reductions in your uh, dewaterability. And one of the theories of why this cation might be the reason for this is what happens to the cations in the system. I already told you that magnesium and phosphorus get taken up. What I didn't tell you is that potassium also gets taken up along with magnesium. So you have a two plus magnesium taken up at the same time as a one plus potassium. And they come up, and they get taken up into the bugs in the aerobic zone and released in the anaerobic zone. Well, if it's just a, a, a one plus and a two plus going back and forth across the cell walls. Who cares? It's the same amount. They offset each other. But the truth is, all of that magnesium that gets released in the digester, we we uh, measure like a few parts of magnesium at the end of the digester. It's because all of that magnesium is reacting with something and turning into something, and it's it, most likely all struvite that that magnesium is turning into. So you've created, a, you brought a bunch of magnesium into your your uh, digester, and you've turned it into a solid, but you've essentially pumped out a lot of potassium and really shifted the balance of, uh, of monovalent cations, which could, which is um, uh, based on some work by uh, Higgins. Uh, Bucknell is showing that that's an indicator of how well you can do water. So let me, let's look at some of the information that we have. And looking at when West Strip was started, we were a little haphazard at the beginning, trying to get things going very well. But I do see right about that point we started, we saw a reduction in the monovalent to divalent uh, ratio. Then we did a bunch of construction, and then we've really hit our stride here in middle of 2013. We see another reduction in that monovalent to divalent. Uh, ratio, which might mean better dewaterability. And if I stare at the the yellow here for the cake solids, it looks like boy, it's going up about this 
similarly to what's going on here. It's not very strong, and what I really want to be able to do is compare it directly. <clears throat> Let's jump into one area, the, the area that I think I can make a difference in, and that's potassium. And we are showing that potassium, we have diurnal fluctu or di ah, seasonal fluctuations in the amount of potassium in the system, but it has been going down and down since we started doing lush strips. So we are impacting that overall potassium coming out of the system. And then I did show the dry biosolids concentration go up, but the important thing to our guys here is, well, how much do I have to haul out? Because it's the number of trucks a day. It does, I could care less if I have less dry pounds, and I'm not really concerned about the percent solids as long as you tell me I have fewer trucks. And we have seen this reduction going down at the same time as, as uh, uh, was strip really hit hit its uh, stride. So we're seeing a little bit a little bit of a indication here that boy, this is something that we as an industry, by looking at phosphorus recovery, maybe we're learning something more about the way dewaterability works as well. Uh, so that's just one of the one of the theories that's going on, and. Uh, is the reason why we, we continue to learn more as we go on. From a dry tons per day, uh, if we just compare the dry tons that are made, there is a huge drop. And you have to look at this and call me out on it immediately and say, Peter, this uh, y-axis, it doesn't go through zero. You're compressing everything and making it look different. So yes, there, it's not quite as dramatic as this shows. But it does show that in 2009, when we started using um, Struvite recovery, we saw a reduction in the amount of dry tons per day that we produce, and maybe even less now that we're doing um, uh, wash strip as well. So we're seeing a, a nice improvement and a real bottom line change to, to the treatment plant. But we still have to consider what's the best place to operate. And that's, that's a little bit of back and forth, and we learn stuff over time. And I've just got a kind of little example graph here, which is, Boy, how much removal do we get based on what pH we run the system? Because the pH that we run the system impacts the uh, uh, the cost of running all that caustic. It, it impacts uh, how the crystals form necessarily. So we do some balancing back and forth. How much do we want to allow of nutrients in the recycle? How much is it costing us? How much maintenance requirement do we need if we're uh, using a lot more chemicals? So this is an ongoing way. I expect those lines, our alum usage, everything that's associated with nutrient recovery, to get better and better each year. Um, and so far, we've been able to make some, some good headway. But I expect it to get better uh, every time we really investigate you know, how well we are doing. So the next the step I want to talk about was what happened at Rock Creek. And uh, so Rock Creek uh, had not been very much a, a biological phosphorus removal system until recently. We do have uh, Ostara there, but we hadn't been doing a wash strip there. Uh, and in the last year, uh, we, we've been uh, finishing up the, uh, the wash strip and the, the primary sludge fermentation project at the facility. And what we did for was strip here was a little different. We ended up pre-thickening the was, but across belts, because we had belts there to work on. We, we thickened it up all the way to 3% solid, so just at the point where we thought we could still keep it mixed in a tank and convey it. We had a tank that would work if we could, we could get to that, uh, that thickness. Uh, and then go over a second set of belts into the WASH strip eight tank. So we thought, boy, this is a really good way to do it. We're able to do it with existing infrastructure with these belts. Uh, we can use an existing tank. This is a great way to do it. We can go from really thin WAS, we're now thickening it instead of from 0.7% solids to one and a half, like we did at uh, Derm. We're getting up to 3%. So boy, we're doing even better here. And then we go across the twice thickened belts and uh, send the rest of the digester, but Man, this is definitely the way, way to go. But it adds a lot of difficulties here. I was very concerned about the amount, how we could actually hit that 3%. And that's what we focused on was, boy, how can we hit that 3%? We don't want to overdo the, the thickening on the first set of belts uh, that we can't pump it. And we don't want to under thicken it so that we have too much flow going through and don't have the detention time. So we focused on that quite a bit. And we're you know, working on how we'd actually operate the belts 
to to uh, achieve that by uh, adjusting uh, the dam at the end of it, the belt speed, everything else to get there, the amount of polymer that we were adding to it. What we found is, man, the operators are great. These guys, uh, I, they deserve every bit of credit. And, uh, and these slides are actually from a presentation that Mike Gates and Chris Maher did at the the annual PNCWA uh, conference. And you see just a little bit here, and they had some great information that they presented on how they learned how to make the system work. And they nailed it. We had a whole complex system about uh, uh, diluting the, the water before. Like, we thought we'd have to get thicken up to 4 or 5% and then dilute it so that it's not too, uh, too thick to go into our, our phosphorus release tank. Uh, but they were essentially able to nail the percentage stably, very well, directly wasting from our aeration basins onto a belt and hit 3%. As a consultant, I would have gotten laughed out of the room for even suggesting that. But these guys can make things work, and I think that deserves a lot of credit um, just in their knowledge of what's going on. And sometimes we get a little more conservative than we need to. But the one problem, and I am hoping, uh, that this will work. I, I, I pulled up a video, so I'm going to attempt to show this, and maybe it will flicker on your screen. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and show this. By running the system up at that 3% solids, what the guys ended up finding was, boy, getting that, that those solids distributed across the belt became a huge pain in the bum. <coughs> And basically, they were having a hard time dewatering because of it. So you should see that here in just a second. If you can see this, and I, I'm going to pause it because hopefully you'll get to see. Oh, shoot. Of course that didn't work. You can see where the belt, if this shows up on your screen, show nothing was very well you know, spread out across the belt. It was just too thick to, to spread out a 3% cake. So they ended up adding push water into, and then you can see what, a video of when they, I'm a little off here, this is right after they added push water, and it distributed across everything. And you're like, oh great, now, now we're using water. We got rid of all the water beforehand and we're ending up using a lot of this water. Well, not only did it help the belt work better, um, it did end up, if we're taking 3% cake, and thickening it to 6%, let's say, and going into the digester, the volume going into the digester still has a lot of that phosphorus and magnesium that got released. They don't have half of it, because you're only changing the size of the stream by half. If we add in this dilution water, we're actually elutriating out a lot of that phosphorus that was in the system. So that was a large positive uh, uh, that we actually got out of the system. Is now instead of just 50% of that phosphorus and magnesium that we worked so hard to have released, we're getting much more of it out of the system. And Bill, I, yeah. Or, uh, Peter, this is Mike. Uh, we got started a few minutes late, but uh, we've got about five more minutes for you there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And hope, uh, did, did, are you able to see the video? Yes. It's moving slowly. Oh, but we awesome. Can... Yeah, um, it, 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 there's a few more that Mike and Chris did that are absolutely wonderful. This says everything to me. I can just stare at it forever, but Michael reminded me I'm, I've actually got to get to my point. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> the summary of this operation, and it's a lot of what I said, is we focus so much on getting to that TS but the operations, we tried to engineer in all these different ways. The guys can actually control this and get down to uh, and get to the exact right uh, TS percentage just by operating the belt with their conventional ways of poly belt speed. You know, working with the maintenance department on you know these are old belts, higher speeds will impact it. Um, but we didn't realize that the waterability of the strip sludge was going to be a, a different thing. Uh, and creating mixing problems potentially with the polymer, and that we're changing that the the, the sludge in and of itself in the in the fermentation tank. And the question is, well, do, does that still end up our solution? Does it end up elucidating more P, or does it actually dilute the wedge strip wedge strip eight, which is going to end up hurting your recovery at the end? Um, 
So I expect as a year goes on, we're going to learn even, even more. Last thing I want to touch on is not the idea of retail outreach, but this public outreach uh, that we've done by actually taking that fertilizer, combining it with uh, another a few fertilizers and making it available in our uh, service district. And the idea of that is going back to the original slide, I'm here not just to uh, serve the people with their wastewater needs, uh, I'm here to serve the Tualatin River Shed. And what's right for the Tualatin River Shed is now to have fertilizers that aren't creating runoff and phosphorus that's going right back in the Tualatin. We can take care of the point sources but we have all these non-point sources. So getting them to think about a fertilizer that works really well there and expose them to what, what we're doing. Uh, you know, we're not the silent heroes. We need to be the, the loud and proud heroes from here on out. So the last conclusions, the reduction in return phosphorus load has, has improved uh, the plant operations by doing struvite recovery. Uh, was strip also improve things? It might improve dewaterability, but the important thing that I always want to leave people with is the change. The fact that 10 years ago, struvite was a nasty word and probably should have been a four-letter word. Um, we're not necessarily thinking about it as nutrient removal anymore, but nutrient recovery. And it's an exciting way in which I think we all intrinsically think about things, but it makes us think about uh, the plant in a completely different way. Um, as we continue to push these new technologies. So hopefully that was a good uh, review of where we are, and now I'm excited to hear about uh, uh, some of the new stuff that uh, Boise has been developing. And uh, we do have a couple of questions, um, or, or at least one question for you, Peter, uh, and that is, is Clean Water Services having issues with struvite? And uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's fines, but I think it means finer, than, so less than two millimeters two millimeters washing out of the star pearl process? Oh, that's a great question. So fines, um, and, and, and I finally got, got people to tell me, what really are fines? They're just really, 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 really small prill. And we end up harvesting, and we go down to about the one millimeter is what we, and that is a good saleable product at that point, just a bit lower than one millimeter. You know, a hundred SGN number. You get lower than that, it becomes something you can't keep in the system, goes back to the head of the plant. I suspect that we'll end up in our, our uh, primary sludge fermenter and become available. It will, you know, that with the acidic conditions, will uh, become phosphate again and then be a problem for our secondary process. So when we do get fines, that is a problem. Uh, we have been changing the way we operate to kind of hit a nice line and what it, trying to discover how solids, how the operation, the upflow velocity actually influence the, the fines production, how we actually harvest influence the fines production, and the amount of uh, solids coming from our dewatering operations, how all of those things tie in to fines production. So. Um, we got a couple things that we've learned so far, um, but it's it's a pretty complex system. And as soon as I make a, a you know, oh, you want to hit for this size number and that will prevent fines, it's not really the full truth. So we have struggled. I believe we've gotten quite a bit better, though, in fines production. There have been some wild conditions. I know some other installations have gotten really high fines production. Um, you know, more than half of it ends up as fines. I've uh, seen others and uh, operations where you're getting like, you know, just a couple percentage of fines production. So going back and forth around that, um, it is case by case specific. But w that's been the majority of our kind of real focus recently is how we can impact that fines production. Great. I think we can uh, get ready for Bill and Ron from the city of Boise now. Bill, I'm going to change this over to you. I want to remind everyone that you can ask questions uh, through the chat, through the question uh, 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 sub-panel there, uh, during the presentation. And then we will uh, get to the Q&A afterwards for everybody else uh, if you haven't asked. <coughs> Bill something, we can return to something for Peter also. So, 
Bill, I'm going to hand it over to you. And uh, before you go too far, I'd like to, uh, at some point, uh, call for that poll number two poll question whenever you are ready for it. Okay, and Bill, we can see your uh, presenter mode there right now with your notes. No, we can see your next slide. That's what it is. There we go. Okay, uh, Bill Binko and Ron Gearhart from the city of Boise. You guys are on. Well, hello. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Do Do you see the webinar window on the the slides, or they, they do not? They just see the uh, PowerPoint. Okay, very good. Well, uh, thank you all for your interest, Peter. Brilliant, very well done. So we will give you the uh, case study from the, the city of Boise here. Uh, I'm Bill Banco. Uh, I'm the project manager in capital improvement, so I deal with the facilities. But Ron Gerhardt, our process coordinator, will give you the operational details. So we'll, we'll cover some of the background and project history, what the basis of design was, and then some of our stories to contribute to the case study. And, and Bill, we are getting a little bit of an echo. I don't know if you've moved in a different position from your uh, uh, phone from uh, before, but uh, it's not terrible. We can all hear, but there's a bit of an echo. So. I think most of you know from Boise there are two treatment plants. The Lander Street is the original plant and West Boise. Uh, and digested sludge from Lander Street is pumped to West Boise via the sludge at Force Main or for central dewatering. Uh, that is Lander Street. It was originally built in 1948 and has been expanded through the years. Uh, it has a design capacity of 15 MGD, but it was not designed for phosphorus removal. But currently, with some synergistic changes and some brilliance, Lander Street is operating in BioP right now, using the step feed aeration process and modifications to the primary clarifiers for VFAs. That's the West Boise treatment plants. And the dewatering building is up here. And this is the Struvite production facility. Uh, these are filtrate storage tanks from dewatering. This is the central thickening building built as part of the phosphorus removal improvements. So uh, West Boise uh, completed its BioP modifications in May of 2015 which includes aeration basins with pre-anoxic zones and anaerobic zones characteristic of BioP facilities. It has a primary sludge fermenter to produce VFAs, and it has a waste sludge pea release tank. Uh, dewatering is done at West Boise for all the solids in the system, and it runs uh, four days per week using belt filter presses. The biosolids are trucked to 20 Mile South Farm. The city owns 4,000 acres due south of West Boise. Uh, the farm was featured in the fall newsletter of PNCWA. So uh, biosolids are managed by EPA guidelines and nitrogen application rates, but the city also monitors phosphorus accumulation as a best management practice. Phosphorus can accumulate and could limit the farm management, which is one of the drivers for the city selecting to construct a struvite facility. The city also has a comprehensive strategy for phosphorus management, which includes pollutant offsets at the Dixie Drain facility. So its construction was finished in the summer of 2016. It's the first of its kind, so it, it chemically removes phosphorus from non-point sources uh, with the goal that the city can find the most efficient economic approach to remove phosphorus from the Lower Boise River. 
So Dixie Drain may have an influence, and it is part of the West Boise permit, on what advanced treatment methods would be constructed at West Boise. So here's the a project history, and I will start this graphic. The city solicited and awarded a design-build contract for the Struvite facility in the fall of 2010. The selected team was Multiform Harvest Incorporated from Seattle, Washington, with Farmer Engineering and JC Constructors from Boise. The facility is designed to handle phosphorus from West Boise and Lander Street. It's a 3,400 square foot building with five struvite reactors. All reactors are the same dimensions, 27 feet tall, an expanding cone with a 9 foot top diameter. Reactors are single pass, upflow fluidized bed. Reactor feed pumps are at the base and have a design flow of 125 gallons a minute. On VFDs, they can operate between 80 and 150 gallons a minute. The struvite bed in the reactors is monitored with PLC using a pressure transmitter to sense changing density. At defined pressure set points, the bed automatically is flushed through harvest valves. A slurry is discharged to a Suico separator or a shaker screen with an 80 mesh opening. Struvite off the screen is conveyed to the product handling room. Each reactor has dedicated chemical feed pumps for struvite reactions. Chemicals are received in 6,000 gallon bulk tanks, which include magnesium chloride. A second magnesium tank has been added because current production uses about 500 gallons per day. Inside so, chemical storage and Bill and Ron, cost uh, yes, uh, we got a real echo, uh, like you're in an echo chamber there, that wasn't there before when we were practicing. So I'm not sure if that's the distance from the phone or or what. But if you can kind of make sure you're doing it just like we when we practice, maybe that'll help. Is this any better? Yes, it is. Okay. I was too excited and crept up to the microphone. <laughs> uh, caustic for pH adjustment and aqueous ammonia are stored inside, and we'll talk more about those chemicals in the presentation. The city has also added equipment not shown in the rendering for heat treatment and reductions of pathogens to satisfy our goal of producing a struvite that can meet the EPA Class A criteria. Struvite reactors are also connected to foul air and the biofilter for odor control. The total project cost through construction was $3.7 million. Some follow-up work for heat treatment brings the total project cost to $4.7 million. So the uh, most agencies uh, are, are going through permit modifications with new pollutants and new limits. The, the lower Boise TMDL is being used as the basis for our next permit. So our understanding is we will have a year-round limit, which is a change from the original concept of seasonal phosphorus limits. So nutrients continue to be the driver in water quality. And phosphorus has to be reduced down to micrograms in the effluent. So if we, we have limits to micrograms, that's very low pounds per day going out to the river. Uh, we have biological phosphorus removal, and the purpose of that is to convert soluble orthophosphate into a biomass. Well, when you put biomass in anaerobic digestion, which most agencies have, that liberates all of the orthophosphates. Uh, there is a percentage that will retain in the biosolids and go to the farm, but you can see from the design mass balance here, the majority of the phosphates has to be recovered or sequestered or something, or it will just go back to the plant drain and return to the head of the facility. So I will turn it over to Ron Gerhardt, who will give you our experiences on operations. Thank you, Bill. And a lot of the things I discuss, uh, Peter has already mentioned. 
Um, so our struvite reactor efficiency is tracked uh, several times per week, measuring all the concentrations in and out of the reactor. Uh, primarily dissolved reactive phosphorus, we just use a hot test kit with a filtered sample to measure uh, the soluble uh, phosphorus in the effluent. Uh, knowing if they're still on reacted phosphate, uh, it will mean that the chemical equilibriums are required to form the struvite haven't been met, possibly due to changes in the phosphorus feed concentration uh, or chemical feed uh, pumping issues. So the goal, obviously, from a filtered sample is to react the dissolved reactive phosphorus and create the struvite. We also measure the total phosphorus uh, as tested with the hot kit, but on a stirred and or non-filtered sample to try to measure the particulate fraction of the total phosphate, uh, much like the fines, basically, that Peter uh, was just addressing. So if the struvite is not retained in the bed and overflows to the reactors, uh, basically the purpose of the facility uh, recovery is lost. And we'll show you some data and examples of the variability uh, in some upcoming slides. Oh, but I should have done that first, sorry. All right, so the city, uh, we use the term SRE for reactor influent, and our SRI, I'm sorry, and SRE for reactor effluent, um, so as we talk about that. So as Peter stated, there's a uh, definite correlation with magnesium and struvite formation. So uh, we measure the magnesium uh, using a Hawk hardness test kit, which can uh, specifically target uh, magnesium. And we track the influent and the residual effluent magnesium uh, in conjunction with the DRP uh, to find that uh, optimum chemical dose and residual. So currently, uh, we have to dose the magnesium chloride uh, to create an effluent residual of 20 milligrams per liter uh, in the effluent, which is almost identical to the background in the influent. Uh, similarly, uh, with monitoring ammonia, uh, we find that the optimum uh, dissolved and total phosphorus recovery uh, occurs at certain effluent residual ammonia concentrations. So the excess is needed uh, for the equilibrium reaction, and uh, we'll actually get into that quite a bit more too. And finally, we also have to control the pH. Uh, I don't know that Peter addressed that too much, but there's a very strong correlation uh, in the reactors between struvite recovery and the pH. So with caustic being uh, one of the most expensive chemicals we use, uh, we give a lot of attention to finding the optimum set point for that. So here's our startup in 2012. Uh, when we first started uh, the facility. We started the uh, production facility with one duty and one standby reactor uh, devoted to just digest or filtrate from the belt filter presses, uh, which you're going to see termed as DFLT throughout the presentation. Uh, and the experience at the time was the struvite production actually uh, before EBPR was relatively straightforward. Uh, one reactor could stop and start, uh, pretty much matching daily uh, operation requirements from the, from the belt filter press. And uh, we had no trouble refluidizing the bed and maintaining it in the reactor. Uh, MHI came in and uh, conducted the startup that was able to establish uh, the bed without uh, having to seed it. And uh, again, at this time, Lander Street was in SEPT mode. Uh, they're adding uh, ferric chloride to the primary clarifier to remove their phosphorus. Therefore, the Lander Street uh, filtrate concentrations were fairly low in uh, DRP. Um, we did not process them through the reactor. So the struvite production in 2012 was uh, consistent, stable, and we were producing about one 500-pound bag of struvite uh, daily. So the startup was successful. Uh, we, you're gaining experience with the DFLT, but there was a noticeable difference uh, in recovery uh, between when the belt presses were operating versus when the DFLT uh, was actually being drawn from the storage tank. So there was a, there was darker color, there was a higher pH, and actually lower DRP concentrations, uh, probably from incidental struvite precipitation in the tank, much less Peter like Peter addressed for his digesters. And this required us to adjust our chemical feeds at set points daily uh, to match those changes in feed concentrations. Also, the reactor uh, feed pumps, we had problems uh, clogging with hair and fine solids. Uh, and we had we have the ability to separate our wash water um, down to the drain and not mix it with a filtrate. So by, sep by separation of the wash water, wash water, it improved the conditions uh, feeding the reactor. But as Peter stated, if uh, sludge got into the reactors, uh, it definitely uh, would be problematic. So uh, it was interesting, Lander was actually the first to convert to EBPR, as Bill mentioned. Uh, so the digested sludge from Lander Street uh, that started being pumped over uh, actually increased in DRP concentration as high as two to 300 milligrams per liter, 
which allowed us to run it through the reactor, but uh, instigated a lot of changes for us and a big learning curve. Uh, the struvite changed into a finer, smaller size, much like we just discussed. Uh, and we'll be covering that uh, in later slides, what we did about that. So then with the EBP, our startup in 2015, uh, we went through um, multiple improvements. Uh, it took some time for the EBPR to come up to steady state, uh, but the city faced a second separate startup of the reactors with PFLT, as we're terming the uh, P release tank filtrate. Uh, so this, so we all end continuing operations of the DFLT reactors. So uh, West Boise with MHI, uh, we have three dedicated uh, reactors to PFLT, and they share the one standby duty reactor for a total of five. And the, the P release facility was constructed in, constructed in 2015. Uh, so you can see it has turbine mixers uh, with a, with a uh, two-pass system or a side-by-side -side system. So the system was designed for one basin in surface, service with the second half for future growth. Uh, the design allowed for VFA addition uh, from the primary sledge fermenter. But like Peter said, we immediately realized that the 120 gallons per minute of available VFA stream we had uh, would be best applied to the uh, aeration basin for the EBPR process. So we started an operation utilizing both sides of the P-release tank uh, with a total volume providing 32 hours of hydraulic retention time. So it's a common question, what percentage of P is released is actually achieved? Uh, we don't exactly know that exact number because we don't monitor the total phosphorus into the P release tank. Instead, we actually monitor the P DRP concentration in the PFLT stream, which gives us a relative value of, of pounds of phosphorus to the reactor. Uh, the PFLT concentrations and variability, we'll talk about that in upcoming slides. And it should be noted that the P release facility does have an odor, uh, much more so than the earthy mixed liquor smell. So this was part of our design. This is the uh, rotary screen thickener room, uh, the designed to separate the phosphate-rich uh, water from the waste solids from the P-release tank. So we had the polymer, and solids are concentrated and pumped to our anaerobic digesters. And the PFLT is collected in a wet well and pumped directly to the Struvite production facility uh, with a 26,000-gallon storage tank allowing flexibility uh, for flow variants and uh, Struvite production. So one RST is sufficient to handle the current P-release flows, which can range from uh, 100 to 180 gallons per minute, uh, depending on, on the wasting rates. So we started operating two PFLT reactors uh, with the PR process and one DFLT reactor. So the PFLT reactors were pretty interesting, and this is where I guess gets a little bit involved. But identifying the DRP concentrations and the magnesium needed ratios uh, took quite a bit of understanding. We had to start adding commercial aqueous ammonia for the design for the struvite equilibrium that we discussed. And understanding the pH adjustments based on the fact that the aqueous ammonia adds, uh, the hydroxide component adds uh, a lot of alkalinity and increases the pH of the wastewater uh, based on what you feed. So the chemical reactions and relative concentration are all new, and it influenced uh, significantly the struvite particle size. When we first started up the PFLT reactors, uh, we started creating an actually a needle shape, not granular struvite crystal. Uh, we actually had to increase the residual ammonia in the SRE from 20 to 60 milligrams per liter, which did change the struvite to the expected granules. We also found the RST performance and filtrate, filtrate capture uh, influenced the beds, and at times, if there was an upset, the reactor beds would retain a sludge blanket of organic solids. So the DFLT side, this is our digester filtrate side, uh, shows the impact of the EBPR process through the digesters. Uh, you note the higher reactor loadings uh, later in the season in the middle of the graph there with successful uh, P removal in the biological process. And also notice the variability in the reactor effluent, the, the orange dots there. Some days it's low, uh, pretty good. Other days we experience upsets and maybe blowouts, uh, which are, includes organics and struvite fines. So operating the strategy, we monitored both, again, the dissolved reactive phosphorus for equilibrium and the total phosphorus for overall capture. 
of the fine particles. And it's, this data shows a period where fine solids were formed but not retained in the reactor bed. Some days, uh, when not corrected, reactors registered negative total phosphorus removal efficiency, uh, which was which was because of the fines overflowing the reactor. The PFLT DRP data also shows the, uh, a higher DRP loading during the summer months uh, when the bio PFLT is working well. Uh, and during the warm summer, the PFLT loading was actually greater than the digester loading in the pounds per day, much like Peter discussed in his presentation. Um, so that directly the result of reducing all that loading to the digesters, as Peter presented. So the total phosphorus through the PFLT reactors uh, shows periods where fine solids were formed and not retained in the reactor bed. Um, it was a challenging startup, learning BioP in the basins and tracking changes in the struvite process for both the DFLT and the PFLT flow streams. So, um, so again, we had two PFLT reactors operating at this time. Uh, and the, the phosphorus release flow volume required one PFLT reactor to be in service with the second leg reactor stopping and starting as needed uh, based on the equalization tank uh, level. We found that during that shutdown and startup of the leg reactor, we had high solids carryover uh, whenever it was started back up for up to an hour. So we experienced quite a bit of carryover during uh, that startup shutdown procedure. So as a, as a result, we started to add dilution water to the PFLT to allow two reactors to operate uh, at a constant flow rate 24-7. Uh, this also, interestingly, improved the particle size, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, and like the DFLT, the PFLT reactor effluent had low phosphorus on some days and negative recovery on others. So, so they're similar to what Peter was showing, and he was pretty excited about that. So Peter, I hope you're watching still. So what happens with the, the plant performance and effluent quality when the fine struvite from the reactors and the chemistries blend uh, in the overflow? So the high loading is returned to the aeration basin. The overall P removal degrades. And the enhanced uh, biological phosphorus removal is challenging enough by itself. And it doesn't need more complications uh, from our recycle stream. So West Boise had incidental struvite formation in the uh, reactor drain lines. Uh, the facility struvite production was expected to reduce the chance of struvite uh, formation in the digesters. It was unexpected to have it in the plant uh, in the plant drain piping from the reactors. So, although it was predictable based on the, the two uh, varying chemical makes up of the of the two streams. So, again, like Peter's slide shows, uh, not a lot of fun for our maintenance staff. So, we worked with uh, MHI and some consultants to try to improve the total. Rem phosphorus removal efficiency of our reactors. So the struvite reaction has some special considerations that are a little different from the other wastewater treatment processes we operate. The struvite saturation potential is the tendency to form struvite and is a function of the nutrient concentrations that we discussed, the pH, and the ionic strength of the solution. So this is what causes the uh, DRP to turn to struvite and it will precipitate when the nutrient concentrations reach those saturation levels that we've been discussing and grow upon itself, ideally, to form the large crystals. However, what happens when the nutrient concentrations reach critical supersaturation, high levels inside the reactor, we count very fine struvite crystal formation, uh, more like baby powder than granules, which are hard to settle and they carry out in the reactor effluent. So this was uh, something we experienced with the PFLT reactors, not quite as much with the DFLT reactors. So the, the kinetic is what defines the speed of that reaction. So with the critical supersaturation, uh, we form that very fine uh, struvite crystal. Uh, it's preferred to react it in the bed and nucleate onto a struvite particle uh, rather than form those single crystals. Uh, so like in the aeration basin where a high concentration gradient such as F to M is a desirable driving force, it's struvite, too much driving force is not a good condition. So in the city's case, the DFLT was near saturation already and had an abundance of ammonia. So again, the magnesium being the limiter, uh, as Peter mentioned. But the PFLT was more dilute at a lower pH and is absent of ammonia. Uh, so we theorized the ammonia available in the digester filtrate can improve the driving force for the PFLT. And the dilution and moderated pH from the PFLT could also help the DFLT driving forces um, to be more desirable. So this is what we decided to do. We worked with MHI and discussed the options that would not conflict with the OSTAR technology or their intellectual property. 
So in our case, we were advised that blending the DFLT and PFLT uh, ahead of the RST thickening process was, uh, was permissible. So what we did is we took samples of the digester filtrate and the PFLT, uh, proportionally mixed them in the ratios uh, we expected, uh, and calculate this, calculated the struvite saturation potential. Based on that, we believed the RSTs could operate without problems from the incidental struvite formation. So now we uh, combined the DFLT and the PFLT pre-RSD. We are now use the term CFLT, as you can see on the screen there, for the combined filtrate feeding the struvite reactions. Uh, we were able to make simple piping connections and, and convert an existing pump to run the blend, uh, to make the blend uh, in uh, mid-August of 2016. So after the few, first few days of operation, the benefits were immediately noticeable. We have stayed with this mode of operation for the past four months, and the data shows uh, significant improvements both in struvite recovery and the overall plant phosphorus removal. We have inspected the RSTs and are finding no problems with struvite buildup. And the flows, uh, the combined flows with some additional dilution water uh, allow a condition that, that allows all three reactors in line to run near their design reactor flow rate of around 117 gallons a minute right now. So the data here uh, shows more consistent total phosphorus removal efficiency. So we want to include the fines uh, in that. Uh, so the struvite loss, the loss resulting in negative capture efficiency uh, by combining these flows, you can see it's been eliminated. There, are, there have been no negative recovery since we've combined uh, these two streams. It's also much simpler running the three reactors with the exact same chemistry, chemical feed rates. Um, and the combined flows solve the problem of fine struvite formation in the PFLT reactors. Uh, and the available ammonia in the digester filtrate flow has completely eliminated the need to buy and add any commercial aqueous ammonia. That was a big benefit for this. So the table shows the improvement in performance. The troubleshooting is no longer involves reactor equilibrium conditions. Uh, now we are finding performance is more related to mechanical issues such as chemical feed pump failures. Or recently, we had a magnesium chloride line to the pump, uh, to the feed pumps actually plug, causing poor DRP conversion um, and low recovery. But you can see by the table there uh, that the combined filtrate produce a much more consistent uh, reactor efficiency. Okay. So the combined benefits. So the statistically, the reactor efficiency is vastly improved with combined filtrate. With EBPR at both treatment plants, we're seeing large phosphorus loading is managed much more effectively with the combined flows to struvite production. And it's quite amazing right now, we're making six to seven, ba seven 500 pound bags of wet struvite uh, as compared to one uh, bag per day recovered when we started up in 2012. So I'm gonna let Bill go ahead and take back over now and continue the update uh, in regards to the Class A production facility. So I, I think the webinar is out of time now. Do we do we still have time? We have ten minutes. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, so the the city has a lot of experience with uh, Class B biosolids running on our farm, um, and the the biosolids rule may not specifically address struvite, but the city established a goal that. Uh, uh, a Class A product would be much more preferred uh, just for uh, record keeping and, and tracking. Um, and just a reminder to those in the Northwest that Idaho works with EPA Region 10 for our NPDES permits and we deal with Idaho DEQ for details on our, our biosolids management. So what this photo shows are the uh, improvements added for the heat treatment, which consist of a, a bulk hopper, a uh, incline feed conveyor, and that is a uh, piece of equipment called the Rolo Mixer from Continental Products Corporation in Wisconsin. So that is the process flow diagram and where we made modifications to add heat treatment facilities. We did a, a fair amount of uh, 
industry research and smaller scale factory testing and then a larger scale testing to select this uh, CPC Rolo mixer. Uh, some of the things that we learned in the process um, was uh, struvite, although it forms hard deposits in pipelines, it, it really can be a rather fragile crystal. So the mixing that we needed needed to be low shear and, and very gentle mixing. These are the steps in the heat treatment process. There's preheat for some energy efficiency. Loading is a, a weighing step. Uh, drying functionally removes some of the free moisture in the product. Uh, heating is for the EPA pathogen reduction criteria and a cooling step and then finally discharge. It's an automated process but operator intervention is also involved. This is the, the PLC graphic of the heat treatment system and uh, the controls that are involved. So the Rolo mixer is an enclosed insulated dryer and there is an external hot water coil heat exchanger. Heat is supplied from both the plant hot water loop, which is lower temperature, and a system boiler is provided if a higher temperature is needed. There's two sets of coils and heat exchangers. Dampers direct air either into the drum for contact with the struvite for direct heating or to the exterior of the drum for indirect heating. Indirect heating from the outside of the drum is recirculated through the heat exchanger. The roller mixer has temperature probes measuring the struvite in the drum and the air temperature in the headspace. From experience, we heat with 50-50 proportion of direct and indirect air to remove free water. After a set dry time, the direct air damper is closed and the final heating cycle is completed with indirect air. The harvest can be managed two ways. It can load directly into the hopper or it can be bypassed into uh, drainage bags. Our experience recently has been to direct the harvest into drainage bags where it's temporarily stockpiled and allowed to usually lose about 100 pounds of water. So the rate we're producing struvite right now, the slurry still comes out fairly wet. This is an example of the heating phase where we track the time temperature for pathogen reduction. So the goal is to achieve a temperature of about 150 to 165 degree temperature range and it must be retained according to the time curve which is about 20 to 90 minutes. Hotter temperatures may be faster but the struvite might become unstable. This is an example of a curve that did not successfully meet the class A time requirements because you can see the temperature starts to drop after a certain time. This was described to me as evaporative cooling where when the temperature gets too hot it drives off the molecules of hydration and then it no longer is the same struvite. This is the discharge step. Operators are notified when the PLC registers the correct time and temperature. Then the operator comes out and provides a cooling phase and then controls the discharge valve and opens up. So the, the mixer has capacity for 6,000 pounds. So it may be required to fill multiple super sacks from the discharge of the batch process. There's the discharge. So that's a, a view of the product of the, the harvest as it's draining and then the, the class A product after heat treatment. That is the uh, finished uh, class A product uh, ready to go to the fertilizer market and all of that does not go to the Boise River. So since startup in 2012 it's been a, a 
learning experience on heat treatment, so we have been stockpiling until the, the final system and changes were made. So there was a, a fair stockpile generated and restored, but we, we are still getting caught up with the backlog and are, are doing a much better job of, of matching production. But it, it is still a learning process as West Boise, to our understanding, is the, the first facility to provide the uh, requirements to perhaps have it recognized as a Class A product. So, uh, conclusions of Struvite. It's a recovery technology quite different from normal wastewater treatment processes. Struvite recovery is absolutely necessary for the city to remove the massive phosphorus to meet the discharge to the Boise River. West Boise has had a boost in success in recent conversion from the two process flow streams to a combined bend and flop process in the Struvite reactors. That change also improved the plant recycle and overall performance of the aeration basins and final effluent. Low ammonia return from the struvite reactor overflow had to be nitrified in the aeration basins. That nitrate was problematic with the anaerobic conditions in the, EB, in, in the EBPR and added competition for carbon. So reduction of the ammonia load was very valuable. West Boise effluent phosphorus concentrations are very sensitive and strongly correlated to the operation of struvite recovery. The WAS release facility helps us liberate the phosphorus ahead of the digesters and it's found to improve dewaterability. Class A struvite is a nice product suitable for distribution without record keeping. But just like any Class A biosolid, it requires more investment and more operations. So thank you all for your time and attention. Okay. Thanks to Bill and Ron. This is Nicole Kaiser. I am a backup moderator. And we do have one question for you. Nicole, we've got really super echo there. Oh, sorry about that. Let's see if this is any better. That so is we better. do have one question. Should I just turn it over to you, Mike? No, go ahead. That sounds that sounds good now. So is Boise taking dewatering filtrate to the RDTs or digested sludge prior to dewatering to the RDT with the P release flow? We are taking digested sludge through the belt filter press and then taking the digested filtrate uh, and blending it with the P release tank discharge for one flow across the rotary screen thickeners uh, to create one filtrate to the struvite production facility. Okay, okay. great. Thank you. Um, th uh, this is Michael Rainey. Uh, we have just a few minutes if any of you have a question. Uh, otherwise, we will um, uh, ask Peter and um, um, uh, Bill and Ron uh, if they have any last minute uh, points that they would like to make and we'll be done. Peter, Bill or Ron, would you like to chime in with anything you thought of there at the last moment? I don't have anything, Michael. No, nothing okay. to add. Okay. So, job well done. We want to thank uh, uh, everyone who attended and especially thank our presenters. Uh, you will be presented, or the attendees will get a exit survey as you uh, close out your viewer. You will also get a follow-up email one hour afterwards uh, on some important things on CEUs. Uh, so I, again, want to thank you, uh, Peter, Bill, and uh, uh, Ron. This, or, this webinar was organized by Lee Lei of, uh, of CH2M, uh, who is the chair of the Emerging Technologies Committee, but something uh, came up uh, very suddenly, and she was not able to uh, attend after she did all that hard work organizing it. 
So Nicole Kaiser, also of the Emerging Technologies Committee, uh, stepped in there for We appreciate it very much, Nicole. So uh, I'm going to uh, close out uh, the webinar for everyone. And uh, we appreciate all your attendance. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.